So if you will now join me in prayer, we're going to start our Sunday service. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. Father God, we thank you that you are here with us. Father God, your word tells us that we're two or more gathered. You are there. So we welcome your presence here this morning. Father, we pray that you would just open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us this morning. I pray that you would remove anything that would hinder us from truly hearing from you this morning, Father God. If there is any unconfessed sin in our life, Father God, I pray that you would bring that to our minds right now so that we may confess it and be able to hear clearly what it is that you have for us, Father God. I pray that you would just bring us into close and intimate fellowship with you here today, Father God. I pray for our praise team as they lead us into the throne room this morning, Father God. I just pray and lift them up and ask for a special blessing upon them, a special anointing, Father God, to do what it is that you've called them to do. I pray for Pastor as he brings the word, Father God, that he would uh, speak your word, Father God, that you would give it to him for all of us with passion, with boldness, and with clarity for your people, Father God. I pray that you would just cultivate our hearts right now to receive it. Father, we thank you for what you're doing through this ministry uh, with the orphanage. Father God, I thank you for that. And I pray for those children right now that, Father, this morning as they are preparing for worship, that you would just speak a special blessing to each one of their hearts, Father God. We love you. We thank you. And it's in the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.
Jesus, the only one who can ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. Give to you, oh, give to you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Oh,
let's, uh, let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are, uh, God, just so deeply grateful, Lord, uh, God, for this opportunity to be here this morning, to gather in this place, Lord, to worship, Lord, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Father God, we thank you, Lord, just as that song, uh, Father, as we just sang that song, Father God, in regards to our redemption, our salvation, Lord, we have nothing to bring, Father. God, we are thankful, Lord, that yet while we are still sinners, Christ died for us, that He is our substitute, He took our place on the cross, Lord, that penalty, that debt that was over was ours to pay, Lord God, but He paid it, Father God, thank you. God, we are thankful, Lord, for your continued faithfulness and provision, Lord, for our every need, Lord, we recognize and understand, Lord, that everything that we have, God, is a gift from you, and I pray, Lord, that today, Lord, as we now come and we give of our tithes and offerings, Lord, that we would do that, Father, with a cheerful heart, Lord, uh, God, and knowing that, that um, God, everything that is good, everything that we have is from you, Lord. Uh, we just pray that you would bless it, Lord, and multiply, God, use of God for your glory, for your purpose, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you this morning? Doing good? Woo! That's, that's oh weird. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm not going to hold you to that. Listen, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our children next door for Children's Church. Okay. And I think we, we missed one thing in our announcements this morning. Uh, we had to postpone uh, the garage sale for the you know the fundraiser for Ashley yesterday because of the weather. So we're going to put that off until the third of December. Okay. So uh, be praying for that. This still leaves opportunity. If you have anything that y'all want to donate uh, to that. Uh, just let me know. I can come get it from you, or you know, if you want to bring it up here, we'll meet together, and I can get that from y'all. But we're going to be doing that on the third of December now. Okay. Uh, so listen, let's turn uh, turn in our Bibles once again. All right, to the Book of Romans. Uh, we're going to be picking up in chapter 14 uh, today. We just finished up chapter 13 last week. Now we're going to be in Romans 14 probably for the next couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, we're getting. Really close to finishing the book of Romans, okay? We're only, uh, including uh, Romans 14, where we're at today. We're just three ch chapters away from finishing up the book of Romans. Um, have you enjoyed it? Yes. yes. I mean, just say you did if you didn't, okay? You make feel better, all right? <laughs> so, no, I mean, listen, you know, the book of Romans is just filled with so, so much doctrinal truth. And, and, and it's just so important for that, for the application of... Uh, the body of Christ, you know, that we understand and know that, you know, this is doctrinal truth, okay, and that we are to be true to doctrine, okay. Uh, that's why, you know, I'm a firm believer in expository preaching, bringing, breaking down chapter by chapter, verse by verse, right, because I know you have the same heart that I do, all right. I want to know what God says, okay, uh, and that's what we're doing here today. We're going to break it down verse by verse, okay. Uh, but the Apostle Paul, we've kind of looked at, let's just kind of recap real quick, all right? Uh, the Apostle Paul has covered many, many uh, things so far, right? Doctrinal truth, right? In regards to uh, the gospel and our salvation. You know, Paul would say in Romans 1 that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for anyone who would believe, first for the Jew, and he says then also for the Gentile. And that's going to be key to what we're looking at here today, but also for the Gentile. Right? Um, it is the power of God unto salvation. We looked at how, you know, that we're counted as children of God. We're when once children of wrath, we're counted as children of God, not because anything that you and I have done or accomplished, right? But by grace through faith. When we place our faith in Christ Jesus, we are grafted and adopted into the family of God. Uh, and we're sealed with his Holy Spirit. We see that in Ephesians 2. But Paul would say that his spirit, right, who lives in us, testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Alright? We are adopted into the family of God. Uh, and then Paul kind of shifts, right, and starts talking, he's, after he's explained these doctrinal truth, then he shifts into Romans chapter 12 and starts talking about application, right, spiritual application, how we take the truth that we have gained from the Word of God and we apply it to our lives. And the first thing that Paul says in Romans 12, 1, is that we're to offer our bodies a living sacrifice to God, right, holy and acceptable to Him, which is our reasonable service, or in other words, our right worship before God. Right, that we offer ourselves fully to God. And what Paul is saying is that all that we have learned, we're to take and we're to put into application in our life. We're not saved by our works, right? That's clear. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourself, it's a gift to God and not of works, lest any man should boast. But then in verse 10 he says, but we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're not saved by our works, but we are saved unto good works, right? That God has planned beforehand that we should walk in them. So Paul is talking about what happens in the life of a believer, right? When we receive Jesus Christ, we become that new creature in Him, right? The old has passed away, behold, all things are new, right? God is doing a continued work in our lives. We talk about, listen, we're not who we once were, and we're still not who we need to be, all right? Because God is working it out in our lives, changing us daily, all right? As we continue to surrender more and more to Him, right? And allow Him to be Lord and Captain of our lives, okay? And that is the true struggle with man, right? Is giving up that lordship to Christ because, you know, that flesh nature wants to take control, right? We want to do things our way. Uh, but Paul is teaching us what it is to offer ourselves fully to God and to give ourselves wholly to Him, okay? Um, Paul is going to talk today about Christian liberty, all right? What that means to us, all right? Um, the, you know, the Bible says, for whom the sun sets free is what? Free indeed. What does that mean? Okay? Uh, we've looked at, right, that we are free from sin, its penalty, but also its power over us. Uh, Paul says in Romans 6, uh, in, in verse 1, he says, What shall we say to these things? Can, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, Certainly not. For how can we who have died to sin continue in, or in it? Right. So we have died not only to sin's penalty, but also its power over us. And Paul's going to talk to us about what it is to live in, in freedom, the, with the, in the freedom that we have received through Christ Jesus. And while you, if you're not there already, uh, if while you're turning to Romans 14, I want to read to you uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, and Nick, you'll have it up here on the screen. But Paul says, Stand fast there, therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. He says here, right? Therefore, be stand, stand there fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And don't be entangled once again to a yoke of bondage. And now Paul is speaking here uh, specifically to circumcision. Because there were those who were coming into the church, those who were coming from the Jewish faith, they accepted Jesus Christ, but they brought a lot of the, uh, the Mosaic law with them. Like the, they, they thought that you had to, 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 to uh, obey the laws given to them by uh, by Moses in the sense of the ceremonial laws, okay? So here Paul is telling us that we're free from those. In other words, listen, those should not be a yoke of bondage for us. Now we are free, right, in Christ. We're free from, from the penalty of sin, its power over us, but also, church, we have been set free, right, to live in freedom. Now, that is not to be abused, okay? Because grace is not to be abused. And what I mean by that is, listen, We've been saved by grace. It's a free gift of God, not of works, lest any one of us should boast. But grace is not license. It doesn't give us license to continue in sin. Okay, And that's not what this freedom is speaking of. And we're going to see that in greater detail as we kind of go through Romans chapter 14. So let's start here. And uh, what I want to do, I'm just going to read through uh, verses 1 through 13 this morning. We'll take a moment to pray. And then I want to go back and we're going to touch verse by verse by verse. Okay? Uh, beginning with verse 1, Paul writes, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. <clears throat> let, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who, eat, who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For, he, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, 
As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, God, we just stand before you humbly, Lord, recognizing, Lord, that apart from you we are nothing. Lord, uh, Father, we have nothing within ourselves, Lord, to comprehend, God, your word. But we need your spirit that leads us into all truth, Father. And we just pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds to you today. Father God, that you would reveal your word to us, Lord, your word that is living and active and powerful. God, shorter than any two-edged two sword, Lord. Uh, Father, it does surgery on our heart. It pierces even the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. Father God, we pray, Lord, uh, Lord, that you would just take your word, implant it in our hearts, God, that we might not sin against you, Lord. Father God, open our hearts and minds to you. Father, I pray, Lord, that if there's any distractions, Lord, that we have brought here, Lord, from this past week or even this morning, Lord, I pray, God, that we may be able to set that aside. Father God, that we might hear from you. And I pray, Lord, for myself, Lord, that you set me aside. Lord, use me as your vessel, Lord. Uh, God, fill, them, fill me with your spirit, Lord, and, and uh, help me, Father God, to preach this word today, Lord in a way that honors and glorifies your name and that is, is true to your word, Father. God, thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's look at verse 1 first of all. all right? Verse 1, Paul says, Receive one who is weak in the faith. All right, That word receive means that you, that, you, um, that you take one as a companion, that you bring them into the fellowship. Okay, You don't turn them away. And he says there that they are weak in faith. Now what does Paul mean by that? Well, he means that, listen... They have a, 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 this idea, and Paul says in verse 2, he says, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Now, if you're a vegetarian, Paul's not saying that you're weak in the faith, all right? Uh, what it says here, right, is Paul is saying that for those who believe one should eat all things, and the others who believe that you only eat vegetables, and most commentaries and most theologians agree that this is speaking of kosher things, all right? Things within the Mosaic Law that God has given to the Jews to, to follow those things that they are not to eat, those things that they are to eat, right? And those days that they are to follow and those days that they are not to follow. And the Apostle Paul is saying here, right, in regards, because Paul would say, I just want to take you down to, uh, to Romans, 14, uh, Romans 14, verse 14, wait just for a moment. And the Apostle Paul says, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Paul says, I'm convinced that nothing is unclean in and of itself. Now, what does Paul mean by that? Well, the, well Jesus would say over in Mark chapter eight, uh, chapter 7, uh, in verse 18, beginning with verse 18, all right, Jesus speaking, he says, So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not receive, uh, perceive that whoever enters a man from outside, what, whatever enters a man from outside, cannot defile him, because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? And he said, What comes out of the man that defiles a man? For far from within, out of the heart of the man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and evil eye. Blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. All right? Jesus says it's not what you put in yourself that defiles you, right? But what comes out, right, of your heart. What, what comes out reveals the heart. And that's what defiles us, right? Um, see, we have liberty in Christ, but that liberty does not give us license to do... I mean, there's still, right, God... God is, And what Paul is saying in verse 1, he says, but not to disputes over doubtful things. All right? And what he's saying about those areas, those gray areas, right, where it's not, it's not uh, clearly um, shown in God's Word, in those areas, we're not to have foolish disputes over those things, right? Um, I mean, that's what Paul is saying. And Jesus is saying, right, that it's not what we put in the body, but what comes out of the body that defiles the heart. Okay? So Paul says that we're not to dispute over these things. In other words, listen, what's not clearly identified to us in God's written word, right? Those areas, those, those things that, and, and can I tell you just from personal experience, I have seen how divisive those disputes can be in the church. They can. Over things that really don't matter because...
because they're not clearly identified to us in God's Word. Right? We know that God's Word is foundational, that it is authoritative. And, you know, I really believe that, you know, the struggle with the church today is we've lost that reality. Like, like we, have, we, have, we have lost the, 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 the idea that God's Word is authoritative in our life. And we are to be a people of the Word to stand on the Word. And that's why the Apostle Paul speaks to Timothy and he says that you, Timothy, preach the Word. Right? Be ready in season, out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering patience. He says, show yourself to be a worker approved to God by rightly dividing the Word of truth. God's Word is important. But church, God's Word, we take what God's Word says and we stand on it. We live by it. Right? We seek it out. If we have any doubts or any concerns about anything in life, man, go to God's Word. And, and God's Word will show us and guide us and direct us. That's what it means that God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. But church, what about those areas that just aren't that clear? And I'm telling you, listen, there's whole, there's whole denominations, there's whole uh, faith and religions out there that have been built off a of false doctrine. Because they have just adopted one thing out of the Word of God, and they have built a whole faith, a whole religion based on that. It's all God's Word, right? But Paul, Paul says, listen, that we're not to dispute over doubtful things. Why? Well, in verse 3 it says, Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. You see, what Paul was concerned about, what we need to be concerned about, is unity within the body of Christ. Okay? And that, listen, those who were coming into the church and, and, and saying that, you know, you have to adopt these things in, in order to, uh, to be saved and to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, they, they, were, they had been received by God. Uh, they had... They had been received by God just as these who believed that they had freedom to, uh, to eat whatever they wanted to eat. I was thinking, you know what, I'm, I'm pretty glad that we have freedom to eat meat. I don't know about you. <laughs> you know, I come from a family. My dad, I'm going to call you out today, Dad. Um, but my dad was one of these people um, that, listen, if there wasn't meat, uh, it was not a meal. Okay? Uh, he had to have meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I can tell you that I adopted that same ide ideology, man. That I, I love me. And in fact, Nikki, when uh, when Nikki and I first got married, she told me she's like, "You you have, you, you want breakfast for, for dinner tonight?" I'm like, "Yeah, I, I, you know, I like breakfast. So I'll, let's have for breakfast for dinner tonight." You know, I come home from work and she has pancakes, <laughs> and I look at the plate of pancakes and I'm like, "Okay, where's the bacon?" <laughs> and, uh, because for me, right, I mean, it wasn't a meal if there was not meat involved, right? So I'm pretty thankful, right, that we have freedom to eat meat, right? And we're not all called to be vegetarians. My mom can tell you, man, she used to have to make special meals for me as a kid because I, mean, I just didn't like vegetables, you know. So, but so we have freedom in Christ. We're not, we're not, um, we're not yoked to that set, that bondage. Okay, we don't. We don't have to adopt the Mosaic Law in that sense in the ceremony system where we have to refuse those things. Christ has set us free. Okay? Uh, but Paul says, uh, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. You see, Paul is talking about this contentions between the two ideologies, right? Those who, who are so legalistic in their ideology that, man, they say that you're just going to push some heavy, heavy burdens on you, right? That you can't do this, you can't do this, or you can't do that, or you can't do that. Right? So many things. But listen, there is, there is freedom in Christ. Okay? There is freedom in Christ. In verse 4 he says, Who are you to judge another servant? And there it is. Right? Who are we to judge? And what this is speaking of in regards to judge means judging to condemnation. To hold somebody under condemnation because they don't agree with you on these things. Okay? He says, who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand. For God is able to make him stand. You know, we're not saved by our, our works. Amen? Amen? I mean, we're all in agreement, right? That listen, we're not justified by our works. We're justified by faith in Christ and what Jesus has done for us. Alright? And what 
Paul, and listen, and I'm a firm believer, and, and I'm not saying this is exactly what he's speaking to, but I'm a firm believer, listen, if God has saved you through His grace, He's able to keep you and make you stand. Okay? It's not about what we do. It's not about, listen, works are a result of a relationship with Christ. Him working in you, transforming you, changing you. And you becoming more like Him because the Bible says we're predestined to become like Christ in, in regards to our character and our nature becoming more like Jesus as we die to self and we become more like Jesus. But Paul here says, don't judge your brother. All right? Don't bring condemnation on, on them because they disagree with you on something that really is, it doesn't, is not strictly, specifically identified in God's Word. It says one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. And here he's talking about observance of days, right? Um, the feast of Israel, those things that, that within the Mosaic law that the, the Israelites had to follow, right? Uh, we know and we look at you know the feast of Israel as being you know foreshadows of Christ and Christ and His coming and Christ has fulfilled those. All right, so when we look back on those, we see Jesus in them, okay? We see what Jesus has done. Those were temporary things given to Israel so that they could maintain a right relationship with God. They, every year, year in and year out, they had to bring their offerings to God and make an atonement for their sins. Well, the Bible tells us right in Hebrews that Jesus is the once and for all the right offering for our sins. They, we, we don't have to continue to bring an offering to God, okay? Jesus is the final, ultimate offering for our sins. And therefore, we stand before God freely forgiven because He has freely given us His Son, Christ Jesus, to die for our sins, to be our substitutionary atonement. And He is the offering, the sacrifice made for us. But he says in verse 6, He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. In other words, listen, those it's, it's a matter of conscience. Okay, There were some, by conscience, who thought that they must obey these things and follow these things. And they were doing it to the Lord. Right? We, you know, for those who, who were convinced as such as Paul was convinced, right, that nothing is unclean in the sense of, right, what God has cleans, right, we can't call common. Um, there in Acts um, chapter 10, whenever we see Peter and he and Cornelius, and Cornelius is, is told by God to send people to Peter, and they find Peter, Peter's up on the rooftop of where he was staying, and God opened up the heavens and like a sheep came down and, and opened up and it was full of things that were um, of, of um, uh, winged animals and, and, and four-footed animals and things that were considered unkosher or unclean. And, 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 the, and a voice from heaven spoke to Peter and said, Peter, take and eat. And he's like, I've never took of anything right, that is unclean. And then God spoke to Peter and he says, don't call right, um, what's, what, uh, um, call what's clean uh, unclean, what I have called clean, what I have made clean. Okay, and that's what Paul, what Jesus, Paul is saying here: that nothing is unclean that God has cleansed, right? That He has redeemed. And of course, what Paul, what Peter, what God was showing Peter, right, is that He was opening up the gospel to the, to the Gentiles, right, not to the Jew only. And Paul says here, right, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. But yet, we are so quick to bring condemnation and judgment on those who don't agree with us on things that, listen, ultimately don't matter in the sense of our salvation and our redemption. Right? In, in the matter of the sense of true, <laughs> the true doctrine. Of, our, of grace and, and what we have received in Christ. <laughs> Verse 7, he says, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. 
You see, that's the important thing, church, is who do we belong to, okay? That's the important thing. Who do you belong to? It's not, if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord, okay? We no longer live for ourselves, but the Bible tells us that we're to live to Him who has given Himself for us. That He is Lord of our life, right? Uh, that, we, that He possesses us, He owns us. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, He didn't, listen, He didn't just die just, to, uh, just to, so that you have a covering for your sin. He did that, but He purchased us. We are His. We are His purchased possession. We belong to the Lord. And we are to live our lives as if unto the Lord. That's why Paul says, that, listen, do all things as if unto the Lord. We live our lives to the Lord because we are His. We're no longer our own. Alright? We are His. Where we were once, the Bible tells us we were once children of wrath. That sounds pretty serious to me. <laughs> but he says, but now we are children of God. Adopted, grafted into His family by faith. When we receive Jesus as Lord of our life, we are His. In church, we are to live in such a way that we're His. But you know, like I said before, that that truly is the struggle of man. Right? That that true surrender of oneself to give oneself fully to God. But yet Paul would say that that is our reasonable service before God. To give ourselves wholly to Him. That He is our Lord. Paul says in verse 9, he says, For to this end Christ died and rose and, and lived again. Amen? Amen? Is that not the gospel of Jesus Christ? The gospel, His crucifixion, His death, His burial, His resurrection. And, and, and he's saying that, listen, all of that was done for you and for me. So that you and I might be restored into a right place with God where we were once separated from Him eternally by faith, right through Jesus' work. You see, the problem was, is the Judaizers would come in and they were trying to add work, or add things to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, it was Jesus and this, right? Well, that's not the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is the gospel alone. It's Jesus alone. Amen. And any time we try to add to that church, we're taken away from what God has already done for us. He has already done any everything that is necessary for our redemption. Everything that is necessary for our redemption is fulfilled and made available to us through Jesus Christ. That and that alone. Church, so we, listen, don't let anybody tell you that you have to, it's Jesus and this, because it's not. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Right? And ultimately, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. That we've been freed with, from, we've been set free. Uh, we have, those things no longer have dominion or power over us. We've been free. Not free to just live any way that we want. That's not grace. Grace purchases us and buys us and redeems us and makes us new. That's what the, why the Apostle Paul says for anyone who is in Christ. Jesus is a new creature. Right? A new creation. The old has passed away. The old, all things are new. I tell you all the time, listen, I'm not the same Randy I once was. Amen. Amen. And that ought to be the testimony of ever, for every follower of Jesus Christ. Yes. I'm a new creature in Christ. <laughs> but then in verse 10, Paul says, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give account of himself to God. It's kind of a scary thing to think about. Yes, it is. You know, the judgment seat of Christ is where the believer will stand before the Lord, and we will have to give an account for what we've been given here. All right, and what we have done with what we have been given here. In regards to rewards. Now, our, we will not stand before that throne and receive condemnation because there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. 
but at this throne, we will have to give an account. And here the Apostle Paul says, right in verse 10, but why do you judge your brother? Right? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? I want to read to you a passage um, out of 1 Corinthians. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and if you'll have it up here on the screen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says in verses 8 and 9, he says, But food does not condemn us to God, for neither uh, commend us to God, for neither if we eat or we are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware lest someone, somehow, this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. And then in verse 13, Paul says, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. You see Paul's conviction here? Paul says, listen, Paul wasn't, he didn't, he, he didn't think that meat would defile him, right? But he was willing to give up meat if it meant protecting his brother from being stumbled, from stumbling. And I, I just wonder, church, if we have that type of conviction in our own walk with the Lord, if we're willing to give up for ourselves in order that we might be, be able to build up our brother. Or where, where are we at in our conviction of faith? Because the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, I'd, I'd be willing to give it up if it meant that I could, I, could, I could save my brother. That I would not leave him into contempt. Because listen, church, so we can push a subject so hard, so hard, so hard, so hard. Right? When it's really not that important. I've seen it. I've seen people walk away from their faith because of things that are just not important. Because we have decided to make something big out of something that's not big. So it's Jesus and Jesus alone. Let's just elevate Christ. Let's elevate Him. And let's have the, the, the kind of conviction that Paul has that we would just say, listen, if it means that it costs me, I'm okay. Because my ultimate priority is to see the lost say, Right? to build my brother up. Because, listen, church, we, we have got to get away from this ideology that, listen, it's all self-centered. Right. Right. I, I, I believe that sometimes, often, that the church can become more of a country club than anything else. Yeah. That the church can be such a place where people just come so that they can get, 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 right? So that they can leave here feeling better about themselves. Yeah. And it ought not be that way. Listen, this is just a building. This is just four walls. But the church is out there. And the church needs to be alive and active, working out there that we might bring more to faith in Jesus Christ. That we might live our lives before men, that they might see our good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven. And we're not going to do that, church, if we're self-centered. Right? It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Church, we don't have the freedom to bring judgment on my brother because they disagree with us on, on certain things like this, you know? And that's the difference, church. We're not, we don't have the right to judge because God alone is judge. Because God alone can see the heart of man, alright? We're privileged only to view and see what's on the outside. And there's a place where we can judge the fruit, but not in the sense of condemnation. And that's what Paul is saying here. Don't condemn your brother. In verse 13, he says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Our heart's desire, our conviction should be that the lost are saved. Right? And that the weaker brother, right, is, is, is built up and not put down and not crushed. And that's what Paul is saying here, church. And I pray that that too would be our heart's desire. So listen, the things that are not specifically addressed, listen, we're to stand on the Word of God. You know I'm, I'm, I'm firm on that. 
Alright? The, the church was never meant to be influenced by society. The church was meant to influence society. That's why, you know, the Pharisees, when they, when they talked about the disciples, they said, man, who are these men who are turning the world upside down? Because they were making a difference and impact in society, right? I mean, the church was growing at a tremendous rate. We just started the study of book, in the book of Acts, and it says that they daily, daily they were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Daily growing, right? In one sitting, Peter's preaching, 3,000 were added to the church in that one instant. Because the church was meant to impact society. To go, therefore, to make disciples. Church, well, that needs to be done with a heart of compassion, a love for mankind, a desire to see the saved, the, the lost saved. And uh, sometimes we, I don't, we, we can't be so dogmatic on the things. There again, the things that are not clearly stated in God's word. Right? They, they, he says, "Don't have foolish disputes." Paul says in Romans, right? As much as it is with you, right? Keep the peace. Amen. Won't you please stand this morning? Paul says that there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. You no longer walk by the according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And you know, we are we are free because God has made us free. Alright? He has made us free. We can walk in that freedom, not to abuse that freedom, but to benefit from what Christ has done for us. He has done it, and we can't boast in it because He has done it. Amen. Amen. Invitations open this morning as they play through this song. And I just want to invite you this morning. Listen, if God has spoke to you in any way, He's asking you to respond in any way. You can do that here. You can do that there, wherever you want. If you want to pray silently where you're at, that's good. But my encouragement to you today is don't walk out these doors and not have them responded to. And if you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, come and talk to me. Let me tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ that saved this wretched man. It has the ability to save you as well. To lift you up out of the darkness and bring you into His marvelous light. To set you free from the bondage that has held you captive for so long. To give you that freedom. It's available to all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll be here to decide as they play for this song. Please come.
this morning. But let me just encourage you, listen, and continue uh, to pray for one another. Uh, we have, you know, several uh, families in the congregation, right, that are suffering, struggling with certain things. And I just want to encourage us, bow a knee every day, right, and lift one another up in prayer, okay? Let's dismiss with a one, two, three, hallelujah this morning. One, two, three. Hallelujah.